Um, the first thing is I want to set out the background and having done this just a week before, the, well, when was it? The 1st of December for Dunoon Community Council at a very badly attended meeting because it was only advertised uh, two or three days beforehand. Um, I wanted to try and make sure that I set out the background in a way that wasn't contentious had Councillor Walsh been here. Because, to be fair to him, he did, apart from one item, set out the background really quite clearly. Um, and if I could maybe just stand, are you okay for sound there? No, it's fine. Can people see that? Um, he wouldn't have said this, this way. But the truth of the matter is that the UK government has been cutting the Scottish government's budget. And the, whole, the overall pot that the Scottish government has got has got smaller. I mean, I, I think that's just a matter of public record. The Scottish Government, in turn, with less funding, um, has had to cut funding for a lot of services, including local government. I don't think there's many people would disagree that that's what they've done. Whether they've done it fairly is a different issue. But we've got... This is the bit that Dick missed out. He didn't mention this, and this is critically important. The population of Scotland's rising. The population of certain local authorities is increasing, and some of them by quite a bit. West Lothian, for example, huge increase in population. But ours is declining, and the formula that gives money to local authorities is in part based on your population. So if the pot's smaller, and there's more people overall, and there's other councils due to get more money because their population's gone up, then you can see why things get worse for Argyll and Butte. And Argyll and Butte has never properly been recognised as an islands authority, despite it having more people living in islands than any other council in Scotland. It's never been done. And not only have we got lots of people in islands, but we've got people in peninsulas that are as bad as islands in many respects, especially Kintyre and Campbelltown. So <clears throat> although we get a, a certain amount of special islands needs allowance, we do not get the full formula. If you compare the amount we get per head to what the Western Isles get, it's like chalk and cheese. Don't ask me for the numbers because I don't know them offhand. And the last point I want to make, and Dick didn't cover this, is that <coughs> Every organisation, whether it's public or private or whatever, they all create waste and they all create their own inefficiencies. And the bigger they are, the more waste and the more inefficient they become. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about BP or a Guy Butte Council. The same basic argument applies. And anybody who studies organisations will tell you that that's true. So for me, that's the kind of background, and it's not a, a, a happy background to, to start with. Just some of the numbers here. It looks as though we'll have to reduce the budget by somewhere between 21 and 26 million over the next five years. The exact amount, we're not sure of, because the Scottish government, I think next week, will set out its draft budget so we'll have a better idea then and we'll know whether or not local government's going to fare better or worse than has been predicted. But until the end of next week, we won't know. Council's budget in round figures is 250 million. And what that means is that in the next financial year, starting in April, we need to reduce the budget by about nine million pounds. Think about it in percentage terms, though. It's actually not huge. So bear that in mind, because this is quite important about how these numbers are made up. What we did to try and address this was, in spring of this year, 
There was an agreement to set up a group of 12 councillors to consider the options, eight from Dick Walsh's administration and four from the SNP group plus trade unions. <coughs> and that was called the Service Choices Project Board. It wasn't a committee or a subcommittee of the council and it therefore didn't have to comply with the council's standing orders. What that meant was that not even the dates of the meetings of this group were known to the other 24 councillors. Not unless somebody told them, but it was never published. The group met in secret, and it was agreed that the contents would be secret. And I want to come back to that, because some of it probably justifiably had to be secret. But no papers were provided to anyone else and no minutes were issued. So this was a, a chosen device by Councillor Walsh's administration because they could have set up a short life working group which is defined in the council's constitution and would have had to say when the meetings were, issue an agenda, issue papers and produce minutes. So it was deliberately chosen because it didn't have to comply with that. And yet it's legitimate and legal, according to the council's chief legal advisor. <coughs> the culmination of that, six or so months down the road, was a series of options, which are basically the ones that are in the public domain now for public consultation, were then agreed to by both the Policy and Resources Committee and by the council to go out to consultation. The SNP group then resigned from the project board, as did the trade unions. But that was only done after all the options were agreed. So this is all, as far as I understand it, the facts of the matter. As far as I know, the project board is still in existence, but with eight people and no trade unions and no SNP group. So I think that's the position in... Gordon might be able to confirm if that's inaccurate in any way, but I think I'm right. Is that right? So, <clears throat> these are my personal views on the current proposals. The starting point was entirely and totally wrong. Because what they did was they looked at all the existing budgets and agreed that some of them weren't going to be subject to any cuts. And then they looked at the others and they gave them all a target, basically, to produce savings. Now, for me, that's just fundamentally wrong. That's not the way to do this. If you've got a big financial problem, that is never your starting point. I'll come to that later. So my argument back in May, and I circulated a paper in this to all the councillors, was that they should identify areas of waste and inefficiency but primarily look at the structure of the council first. And once you've identified structural issues and waste and inefficiency, then you had a look at what we actually did as a council. But it was ignored. So some of the proposals that are in the current service choices, choices uh, consultation might be acceptable, but for me, many aren't. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. And some of these are just nuts. There is no other way for me to describe these. The first example I've given is that you re some of the, the options say reduce or stop planned maintenance of properties. Now, I think all of us know that that is just storing up trouble for the future and probably in the long term will cost you more money. So for me, it's just... An complete nutty idea. There are funds being proposed to take away from what you might call preventative services, which will cost the council money longer term. I'll give you an example of that. They're taking big chunks of money <coughs> out of what looks innocuous. It's called housing support services. But these are services to try and avoid people ultimately becoming homeless. So if they get into difficulty with their rent or 
with our landlord or whatever, then there are services across our Gail and Butte, usually run by the third sector, not the council, that help stop that happening. And that makes sure that the housing associations continue to get their rent and that the council, which pays for the homelessness if people did become homeless, don't have the problem. So if you cut those services, for me, you'll increase homelessness and that costs the council far more. And this last one, I only really got my head round yesterday after having a long telephone discussion with the head of service responsible. Because there's a proposition in there, it's not a really big one, that they'll save 700 grand by creating a charitable trust and making the management of the swimming pools and um, public halls like the Queen's Hall and the Corn Halls and Oban. They'll all be managed entirely by the trust. And it's showing a 700 grand saving. Not this year, but the year after. Right. So not, not from April 16, but from April 17. And I said, well, how are you going to do that? And the answer was, well, we think we'll save half a million quid in non-domestic rates. Because if it's a charity, it won't pay rates. And I said, well, there's two problems with that. One is, it's not guaranteed. But the second thing is, you've got another proposal elsewhere in the options that proposes reducing the discretionary rates relief for charities. So where do you get the 500 grand from? So we agreed that the 500,000 pound saving was in no way guaranteed. I said, so where's the other 200,000 coming from? Well, and I, I'm not using exact words here, because I don't want to, because it had a very productive conversation. But he basically said, well, we had a target of savings to make, so we, we knew we had to save 700. So we added the 200 to the 500 to get the 700. <laughs> Therefore, there's no rationale whatsoever to that huge 700,000 pound saving. It's mince. It may not happen at all. It also might not happen for other reasons. You know, who are they going to get to create a charity and be on its board running things that cost a fortune at the moment. Well, it can be, because other councils have done much the same. Uh, Glasgow Life, for example, was one of the biggest ones in Scotland. They have been, but nonetheless, it's probably possible. The issue in Argyll and Butte is getting the people to, to be on the board. I think this might work at a local level. You might get a Queen's Hall Trust, you know, to do it. But are people in Dunoon really going to be interested in the problems of an ailing building called the Corn Halls in Oban? Can't see it. Anyway, so those are just three of the examples that, for me, just put big holes into what's there. So some highlights from the current budget. This is just a different look at it. I've been asking a lot of questions about what the costs are. Top three layers of management the council. That is the chief executive, three executive directors, 11 heads of service. They cost 2.053 million pounds. And guess what? It's out of scope. It's not touched. Now, these costs that I've put against these posts, and remember we're talking posts, not people, detach the personalities from this. The council's on costs for employment purposes now over and above the salary are running at over 30%. 30%. So the chief executive post costs us 158 grand. Executive directors 126 each. Heads of service 93 each. Now for those to be out of scope and I want to come back to this is an absolute no-no for me. Not just because of the cost, but for other economic reasons. 
the cost of the management staff in the education department, which is our biggest department, and these are the posts over and above the level of the head teachers in the schools, 1.132 million pounds out of scope. The operating costs of the building in Komori are just under half a million pounds a year to heat it, light it and maintain it out of scope. And yet, within the last several months, the council agreed to take on seven new economic development posts at a cost of 333,000 and almost on the same day they were talking about grassing over all the annual flower beds in every town in Argyll and Butte to save money. What that? For me, it's nuts. There is no stated case that these seven posts at £330,000 will produce any additional economic activity in the council. It's hoped they will, but that's the best of it. So that's just perhaps a, a very partial view at where we are, but I think it's a pertinent view. And the reason I've zoned in on these expensive posts is very simple. I don't think anybody wants to do away with any jobs at all. But if you do have to do away with jobs, you always have to look at the most expensive posts. And the reasons are, First of all, these people tend to be better qualified and more mobile than the people in the lowest salaries. So they're more likely to get another job. Secondly, there are far fewer of them. And therefore, you affect fewer individuals. And thirdly, which is the point about your question right at the start, they, they tend not to spend all their money in the local economy. And the example I gave at the first seminar in April about this was that if you've got a choice between one post at 60,000 and four at 15, you always go for the one at 60 because they put far less money into the local economy than the four posts at 15. And there's not an economist anywhere in the world who will tell you different. That's just reality. So it is important that you... This isn't about personalities. It's not about taking aim at people that you don't like or you don't think are good. This is about just simple impact. So the issues as I see them is that it's too centralised and staff and councillors are left to chase things up and down the structure. Every day, even the simplest thing. I mean, right at the start, Gordon wanted to try and get a promise fulfilled that had never been fulfilled, which is to put floodlights in the play park at Sandbank. And it took how long? Three years? And it was just Mark and Polis trying to get it done. Because what happens is that everything goes up and down to Komori and back down. And sometimes it goes back up and it never appears again. It's not a black hole, it's a black mountain top. You know, it's just, it's crazy. And I know that councillors, on average, spend 60% or more of their travel expenses simply going up and down to Komori. I think there's a minimum of a million, probably 1.2 to 1.3 million to be saved by taking Komori out of the equation and localising a guy on view. But... <clears throat> it's not just it's cumbersome as well, it's, a, it's an apex, it's a triangle that you're looking at. And it's far too top heavy. It was quite interesting, somebody in Dunoon locally had a look at the new organisation chart when they came out a couple of months ago. It says, hang on, 11 heads of service, 3 executive directors and a chief executive. What's all that about? And this is somebody who worked for a very, very big company in the UK. Couldn't understand it. So it is top heavy. And maybe worst of all, democracy is terrible because we are not accountable to you. All the decisions in the main are made in Komori. And I have seen at first hand councillors say at a local level, don't you worry, I'll get it sorted. 
they go to Kilmory, they vote a different way, and then they go back to their constituent and say, I'm sorry, but that was the way the vote went in Kilmory. It's just the way the council works. So it doesn't work because we don't see decisions made locally and councillors are not accountable locally. The classic example for this for me, and this is what really convinced me of it, was the sword being put in to the community by a castle tower by the Helensburg councillors, who probably would never have done that had the situation been in Helensburg and Lomond. They were able to stuff something because they didn't like it and they knew fine well they would never be accountable to anybody in this room or anywhere in this whole area. They can do what they like. And that's not democratic. So my view is you need to simplify and flatten the structure and make as much decision making and service delivery local. We need to get rid of waste. And there's no bigger waste than the huge sums and time and money spent travelling to and from Komori. Because don't forget that for every... 40 odd pence a mile that somebody picks up in travel expenses. They're also wasting their time by driving and not doing. So, here are some alternatives. I'm nearly finished. Convert the top three layers to, to sorry, that should read the four local areas, because there are four local administrative areas. This was done in a bit of a hurry this afternoon. So, the, each local area has got a local area manager with a small team, and that, that team has got clout. So, if Gordon Blair wants the lights put up to fulfil a promise to the community in Sandbank, he goes to the area manager and says, get that done, please. And the area manager says, well, I can or I can't. And if he can't, he's got to explain that. But if he can, he gets it done. And he says to the guys in Rhodes Lighting, put the lights up. But at the moment, that's impossible to do. That one saving alone will save over a million pounds. <coughs> My guess is that you can take at least 30% off the cost of councillors, and that would save 386,000 quid a year. We can take a million pounds out of the travel budget, mostly with the decentralisation, but the other bit would be by way of investment and good video kit. We've actually managed to get that now in Komori. That's only happened in the last couple of years, but it's got nowhere to connect to. Honestly, it's because what we've got at a local level is just dross. And it, it's unreliable and it doesn't work. So I've now got today a budget price to do each of the local areas from the guys in IT. 50 grand a pop. <coughs> so you, you might spend £300,000 out of the council's reserves to put in <coughs> proper equipment so that people don't have to travel. And I mean, it will pay for itself in a year. Reduce the education management costs by between half a million and 750,000. I think that's a relatively straightforward one to do. My view is we'd shut the million pounds that we spend in economic development, because I don't see it developing anything. Take half a million pounds saving out of it and contract with Highlands and Islands Enterprise to deliver the other half for us. And that means that all economic development activity in the area is the responsibility of one organisation. <coughs> and I would do what Mike Russell, I think, rather unwisely suggested, which is shut Komori because it will save half a million quid. And I've asked the question last week, where else could we relocate people to if Middergail was just a, an administrative area? Because we've got loads of offices in Campbelltown, Isla, Tarbert, and in Lockilped. Could we do it? Would it work? But I didn't know when Mike Russell came out with his let's close Komori remark, he didn't know what it was costing. But I now do. It's half a million. So why wouldn't you? Because it's an old building and it's just a problem. The issues here is it's going to be very hard to shift this centralised culture because it's actually got worse over the last number of years, not better. And lots of jobs have disappeared, you know, out of Argyle House, for example, and have gone to Komori. Lots of them. And that's happened under the current management. That's what's been allowed to, to go on. 
This is very contentious. The Chief Officer Salaries Agreement, which is a lovely, cosy wee agreement in Scotland, is just wonderful. They define for certain sizes of local authority what the Chief Executive gets, and then the two tiers below that get a percentage of that. My view is it needs scrapped, torn up, because it's just not feasible. You can't make the one, pound, the one million pound savings if you've got four chief executives in the four areas all cost us 158 grand. It's not feasible. It'll take time to do some of these things, but maybe not as long as you think. I think some of these can be done in four months, if there's a will. Unfortunately, there won't be, even if the principles agreed. There are vested interests everywhere. And you can understand why that is. That's just human nature. We might need to use some of the council's reserve to tide us over, and that will create some opposition too. But the council's got very large reserves, £50 million, pounds, but a lot of it is committed, I am told, but haven't yet seen the list of commitments. But there's about £12 million free, and I think we need to use some of that to give us time to restructure and fix it. And change on the kind of scale we're talking about inevitably creates its own risks. This is not risk-free. So I'm not saying this is a complete panacea. It ain't. And the last point is I think we might need to actually shut down some services completely. When I've now been going through all of the list of options, it strikes me that what we're doing is chopping away big time at services. And actually, you might be better biting the bullet and saying, we shouldn't be doing that. It's not statutory. It would be popular with some of the people, but let's just stop it altogether. Because the savings in so doing, in some cases, are enormous. Absolutely huge. And I'm not going to suggest what they might be, because it will just create a diversion in the room. But uh, it, th these are the kind of things that I think we've got to think about. Because if you keep cutting and cutting, you end up with a duff service that nobody likes or wants. So maybe we need to be more brutal about this.